Andiamo a cucinare. Let's go cooking. Why? It makes me smile. Today we're going to make mussels with garlic, ginger, and sparkling wine. And swordfish steak with salsa fresca and green peas. An old Sicilian recipe made simple for you. And an old school dessert from Palermo. Gelo di melone. And find out how my father's dream became my reality. Come for the recipes. Stay for the story. Mariuccia. Mariuccia is an interesting name. It's very interesting because uh, I once went shopping with my father for this wonderful meal we we're going to make for the family because my father wanted to show me how to cook this secret dish. He took me to the harbor of Palermo. He stopped the car. He walked out of the car, went all the way to the end of the pier. I followed him. I didn't know what he wanted to look at. I've been at the pier many times before. I didn't think it was anything special. And then once he got to the end of the pier, I remember he took out his cigarette, put it in his mouth, lit it up. <laughs> took this big, big blow of smoke puffing right out. And I still did not know why we were there. And then he said to me, her name was Mariuccia. My father Vincenzo was a most interesting character with a passion for cooking. Especially when we would discover something new, a new ingredient. He had to try it to figure out a way on how to fit it in. Zenzero, that is the Italian name for ginger, was one of those things that was quite a challenge for him. He tried it in many different recipes. It didn't quite work out, except, except for this wonderful recipe. Mussels with garlic and ginger. This was his opus. Let me show you how to make it. You're gonna love it so much, you'll make it for your family. I want this oil to get nice and hot. To the oil, the next thing that we're going to do before we add any of the other ingredients is a little bit of red pepper flakes. By frying them into the oil, we make the oil spicy. The first addition that I'm going to make to the oil, as the oil is starting to get nice and hot, is the addition of the ginger. What I've done with this ginger, I cut it into small pieces, just like this. So you don't want to put too much, because the ginger has a very, very predominant flavor. The reason why I added this oil into the process is twofold. First, I like it to brown a little bit. I would like to release this flavor into the sauce, giving the sauce the base that we're looking for. Then I also like it to have a little bit of a jump on the garlic because it takes a little bit longer for the ginger to cook to the point that it becomes nice and soft inside your mouth. If you ever do not like to have such large pieces of ginger, chop it up, but don't add it until the end, as you would with chopped garlic to something hot. You still will get the flavor, but you will not have the creaminess that this does. Now, this one has picked up a nice roll. Let's go with the other ingredients. Some garlic, garlic cut nice and thick, almost the same size of the ginger. Let's put it all in. After all, garlic is good for you. And then the red onions. Now, chopped them nice, let's add them in there. At this point, one of the things that I like to do is to get my trusty red spoon and stir. And then also what I do, I reduce the heat from high, which I had it before, to medium. In this process, I have a better command on everything that's taking place. I can watch it, make sure that nothing burns. There I can see already the ginger picking up the wonderful color that I was telling you about. At this point, another thing that I like to do is to add a little bit of the herbs, and we're going to go with the chopped parsley. People always ask me, why so early into the process? It's going to burn, it's gonna become black. That's not the issue for me. By adding it now into the base of it all, what will happen for us is that it's gonna fry and release its flavor into the sauce. Giving the sauce this finished look, this is spectacular. A little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. Mamma mia, che aroma sta uscendo fuori. Translated from Italian, it means what a wonderful aroma is waffling through into the air. Oh, this is the point in which you want to go ahead and add the mussels. Now, mussels fresh. If anybody tells you that they got a great recipe with frozen mussels, you do not want to be friends with these people. They're trying to kill you. Fresh mussels is very important. You also have to realize that mussel is something quite delicate. In spite of the fact that we have a large number of mussels in here right now, 
several of these pieces might not open up. If the muscle does not open up, it means that it's dead. You've got to get rid of it because it's not good to eat. Actually, it will not make you feel too well. The reason why I'm mixing it all together right now is because I'm trying to get all the flavor base that we have in here, a little bit of just about everything, coating every piece of muscle that we have in there. Is that important? Very important. I told you already before that this is one of the recipes that my father uh, put together, but the real key was not just in the uh, uh, ginger. Uh, my father decided uh, as part of the wine reduction not to use regular wine, he used sparkling wine. So I remember as a little boy, I said, Papa, lo champagne. No, no, it's champagne, prosecco, Italian sparkling wine. So to this very day when I make it, I always use some kind of Prosecco when I add it to it. You can do it anything that you want as long as I have some bubbles. And the only difference that the wine will bring is a, a bit of effervescence in the sauce. Here we go with the sparkling wine. To make the sauce even deeper, even richer, I like to add some stock. You can go with fish stock if you have it handy. Or if you don't have it handy, Go ahead and use some chicken stock. And this is what I'm gonna be using today. White chicken stock. Chicken stock is very friendly, meaning it does not overtake the dish. That does not fight with the other ingredients overtaking them. Rather, it is much more mellifluous, more agreeable. It allows itself to really be taken over by the beauty of the other things and together with them, play in a collaborative process instead of dominating. And I find that very important in just about anything that's artistic. One of the things that I like to do at this point is to look and see for which pieces might not have opened and just get them out. I think I need to go out and buy a lot of ticket because all of them have opened up. I've done a great job. I also gotten very, very lucky. When you cook the mussels, you want to make sure you don't overcook them. So once they opened up completely, boom, like this, to so show you and say, here I am, let's do something. At that point, I give another four minutes and I keep stirring about. But there is one ingredient which is quite important at this point, which you have an option to use or not use. What could that ingredient be? Typically, it is not a Sicilian thing. Basically, using butter is more of a northern thing. But my father became adept very quickly and married my mom, who's from the northern part of Italy, Venice. The beauty of cream and butter, and he found a way to add it to this. And what I like about this is the dish is made of two things. The first thing, obviously, is the flavoring that we were able to give to the mussel. But the best part is the sauce. And that sauce, trust me when I tell you, a single serving, you might need a whole loaf of bread because you'll be dipping in it all day long. And here we are with a little bit of butter, just a tiny bit of the glassatura. Che piatto favoloso. Che bellezza. Che fantasia. What a beauty. What fantasy. These are not words that I use all the time, but they remind me greatly of the way my father used to describe his dish. Well, my dear friends, we are ready to plate this. Let me show you how to do it. These mussels are more than just seafood, as far as I'm concerned. It's a long-lasting memory of my dad and the beautiful things that he taught me how to make. They're fantastic, they're full of flavor, and they have, in my opinion, truly the secret of optimism. A man who kept trying and trying and trying until he found the right solution with the right ingredients and the right combinations of flavor that made this dish real. I think that this dish should be on him to optimism. And that was exactly what my father was, one of the greatest optimists I knew. After all, he was my dad. Signori e signori, this is how you make mussels, garlic, ginger, and sparkling wine. I said Mariuccia. And for a moment, I didn't say anything else because there is no Mariuccia in my family. My mama uh, is Massimiliana. My aunt is Buliti. One grandma is Maria. The other one is Adele. Who's this Mariuccia? And I didn't feel like I really wanted to know what was happening. My father repeated it again and says, her name was Mariuccia. And as he did that, he reached inside his pocket of his jacket. He pulled out a yellow document, something that God knows how long he'd been keeping it to show it to me. And he gave it to me to look at. 
the document was a legal document for Mr. and Mrs. Tellino, who had been approved uh, to board the SS Mariucha. They would have taken him to New York, where he was going to immigrate to the United States as a chef. <laughs> Swordfish for Sicilians like me is just like steak for Texans. Why? It's a favorite fish, especially in the coast of Sicily in summertime is the only fish. I would like to show you a very simple way on how to make a steak or swordfish with an accompanying sauce that truly brings out the best elements of the fish. The sauce is made with tomato sauce and peas. So simple, so good. Let me show you how. We got a nice high heat on the pan. We're gonna add the extra virgin olive oil. In this oil, we are going to cook what I refer to as the base of our sauce. In spite of the fact that we're going to use a tomato sauce to make this sauce, you need to have certain other elements working at the base of it to expand, to open up the flavor. One, you know, it's the thing that I use all the time, that's red pepper flakes. I like to add them because it allows me to control the amount of heat that you have. Uh, red pepper flakes, I find they're usually a quarter of a teaspoon, which is a a good pinch of, uh, of your finger is enough just to give it a present. If you're anything like me and you're not cooking for my wife, then you should do more. And I do it twice. It puts out this wonderful spiciness to it. While the oil is getting nice and hot, and take a look at the pan, you can already see it from the red pepper flakes. You can see the bubbling of the oil at the bottom of it, dancing, and you see them just twisting and turning around. At this point, before the oil gets too, too hot, what you want to do is to add the garlic. As in all Stellino recipe, I like to cut my garlic nice and thick. We're going to brace this for quite some time. Eventually, the garlic will be so soft that when you go to bite into it, it will be like this wonderful garlicky marshmallow-like cream expanding across your tongue. It will dance in such a way in which you will say to yourself, mamma mia, I'm happy. You'll be right. This is the kind of food that makes you happy. Now, as the garlic enters the pan and it starts to cook like this, I like to lower it from high heat to medium. It gives me more control in making sure that the garlic does not burn. We want it to brown, but not to burn. The next thing that I like to add is onion. You can use any kind of onions you want. Me, I use red because they're my favorite, and they give a lot of flavor to the food. Not that the other onions don't. In the end, really, it's very much of a preference that I have. Well, this is taking place, I like to put fresh herbs in there. In this case, I have a mixture of both basil and parsley. If you really want to get adventurous, you could also use mint, but be very careful. If you use mint, make sure it's not more than a teaspoon for this whole thing because the mint could completely take over. Now, while this is cooking, I like to add a little bit of acidity now to kind of give a specific taste to it. And we're gonna go with a little bit of white wine. Once you add the wine, immediately you raise the heat and you start stirring. Why? Look, for me it's not a problem. I have a non-stick pan and nothing sticking to the bottom of the pan. But when you do this at home, if you're working with a stainless steel pan and you cook for quite a long time, you'll find that there are some little brown bits at the bottom. Sometimes people believe that the brown bits is burnt most of the time, really, is highly reduced juices that you dislodge now, you bring back into the sauce. You can see here the color slightly changing. These are many of the juices that came out of the onion as they were cooking, came out of the garlic, and they stuck to the bottom of the pan, and we have brought it back in. Ah, this aroma already is splendid. I want to cook this until the wine reduces by half. The wine has reduced to the perfect consistency. Now I'm gonna lower the heat. I'm gonna bring it back down to medium. And this is the additions that we're gonna do. The first thing is going to be tomato sauce. And the other thing that we're gonna add is chicken stock. If you don't have chicken stock, fish stock would be even better. Do not use beef stock, why? Beef stock and fish is not a mixture that I can really get behind. The next thing that we're going to add is going to be peas. Now, these are frozen peas, and they're ideal for this because we're gonna add it as the sauce starts to boil. Once the sauce reaches a boiling point, you're gonna reduce this to a simmer, and we're gonna let it simmer for about 15 to 20 minutes. So, while the sauce is simmering to perfection, let me move it to the back of the stove into another burner, and I will show you how to make the swordfish.
this is a fantastic slice of swordfish. I have cleaned it just right. Already salt and pepper on one side. I'm gonna put it face down. As soon as it hits the stove, I reduce it down to medium. A fish steak this size, you want to cook about two and a half, three minutes per side on medium, medium low. While the steak is cooking, and I keep calling it the steak, truly is fish, it's swordfish, but to me, I call it the steak of fish. We add a little bit of pepper on the other side and a little bit of salt. Whenever you can, try to use sea salt. I find that the flavor of sea salt is much more conducive to this. The importance of letting the fish cook untouched into the hot oil is quite important because it allows for the fish to build a crust on the outside, sealing all the juices in. If you overcook it over the high, high heat, it will be brown on the outside and completely dry on the inside. Two and a half minutes per side is a good start. And also one thing that I want you to see, look at this round right over here. This is usually where the skin comes out. When you buy the swordfish steak at the store, they give it to you with the skin. Nothing wrong with it, that's the way it's supposed to be. This, my father would call il taglio del conte, the count's cut. He used to make fun of me. I never wanted the skin of the swordfish. And whenever they make it for me, I would ask them to cut it out because I wanted to have the clean steak, exactly the way in which I'm doing it for you right now. Is it necessary to do so? No, really it's not. But in my opinion, it makes the fish look even better. Let me check and see how we do it. All right, the fish is cooking perfectly well. Let's now turn it and let it cook on the other side. Now watch the technique that I do. I put it underneath. This allows me to guide the fish as I do it gently and look. This is the color that you're aiming for. We're gonna let this cook a few more moments and you will see what we're going on. Now the things that I love the most, this little picking up of the brown, you see it's just on the edges, which still means that the fish itself, and you see as I touch it, has this wonderful tenderness to it. The ability to retain the juices inside the fish is the most important thing that you must master as you cook fish. If you treat the fish with respect and attention, the fish will taste wonderful for you. The fish has finished cooking. This is exactly how we like to have it. I'm touching it here. There's a nice resilience going back, meaning that the consistency is perfect. Now, let me show you how to play this wonderful fish. First thing I like to do is to put the richness of the sauce all over the plate at the bottom, like a nice little lake. Make it so that the fish does not feel as if it come out of the ocean. It has its own ocean made of tomato sauce, garlic, onion, wine, and peas, just like this. To me, what makes it unique is the memory that I have of my youth in Sicily the love that I have for swordfish, and the combination that I have with something that's so basic, so simple, that anybody can make in their home, in their kitchen, with the average pots and pans and ingredients that you find at the store. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is how you make Sicilian swordfish steak, tomato sauce, and peas. My father had never worked in a kitchen before. He always had these ambitions of being a chef. So at the moment, I kept the document in my hand that I looked at it and I realized that he gotten his uh, work permit to come to the United States just a few months before I was born. Both him and my mom made a choice, and the choice was to give me a life in Sicily, protected, surrounded by my family. Gelo di melone, watermelon pudding. This is a Sicilian specialty. Actually, it's a specialty from the town of Palermo, where I come from. Let me show you how to make it. It's wonderful. We have processed the watermelon to the perfect consistency. Now what I want to do is to strain it. To make my life easier, I moved everything into this container right here that allows me to control the pour. Is this a big deal? Does it make it taste better? No. Let me make sure that your kitchen is not messy while you do it. Once it's in there, the next thing that we want to do is using the back of a spoon or an instrument like the one that I have, you want to push all of the liquid right through. Now, the big pieces, with other pieces of seeds, are going to be held back. And this is great because this is going to give you the opportunity to have a wonderful, smooth texture. 
but also what it's doing for us is giving us the opportunity to make this even smoother for its final product. Whatever is left behind that doesn't go through, don't worry about it. It's not meant to go through. You just want to have the smoothest and the finest of textures, and this process is what ensures that for you. The watermelon as it is, is sweet on its own, but to be perfect, it needs to be sweeter. Sugar is our best friend. So what I like to do to this amount is almost to add anywhere between a quarter to a half of the volume in sugar. Remember that this is going to be cooked, is going to be reduced, and this sugar is going to bring out this enormous flavor. Why is it that Sicilians love sugar so much? Salt was always something that came from the sea. It was very inexpensive. Sugar, on the other hand, most of the sugar refineries were up north. And the southern part of Italy really did not have access to sugar. And the reason I think why Sicilians like to cook with sugar is to show off their wealth. It was one of the most expensive spices for a long time. But in this particular case, it has a function, and the function is that it really brings out the flavoring that we want. We are perfect. Well, let's put this into a pot, let's cook it, and let's reduce it to put in consistency. The strained mixture goes straight into the pot with the heat underneath. You will notice as much of the sugar likes to inhabit at the bottom, you have to reincorporate it back in there. You start out on high heat, then you reduce it to medium high, and you bring this to a boil. But there is one very important ingredient missing, and what is that? Sugar we have, watermelon we have. What else could it be? What dessert do you know that does not have vanilla? Find the most flavorful vanilla extract that you can find. And at this point, you want to add it. This is going to give a roundness to our dessert that really is going to bring it to the highest level of perfection. And then keep stirring. We want for the sugar to incorporate with the juice. We want for the juice to get to a boil, because once the juice gets to a boil, we can make the other addition, which is going to thicken this up into a pudding-like state. The mixture in the pot is super hot, it's rolling, boiling. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna lower it down to medium, and now we're going to make the addition of the slurry. The slurry is nothing more than a mixture of water and cornstarch. And then to control the flow, here's what I like to do. A full spoon, and I bring it in. Another one, and I bring it in. And now, you want to make sure that energetically you stir. So what's going to happen is that the cornstarch eventually is going to solidify, bring to a pudding-like state this mixture that we have. As you can see, and this is the part that I really love, I'm sorry I get like this. It reminds me of when I was a little boy. This thing is getting thicker, the color is changing. Do you remember before when it was in the rolling boil, it looked as if all these entities, the pulp, the water, the sugar were separating. Now they're coming together. The cornstarch is doing exactly what I was hoping, it's bringing everything in. And it's bringing it not by force, but it's like a dance. It's a joyous emotion where all these ingredients understand that they're working together for the greater good. Is this really happening? In my head, I paint all sorts of pictures. But that's how I make life beautiful. I create the painting of joys inside my head before they come out of my kitchen. At this point, you want to be attentive, because you don't want to go so hot that you could break the molding. The mixture is almost ready. Come, take a look, look at this. You can see it thicker and thicker. And now it's time for us to strain it a second time. Let's do it. Nectar from the gods. One of the things that I love at this point is to see it just pouring through. It's already thick, but it'll get even thicker as it gets cooler. And then right through the strainer, push through. I guarantee you, unless this time is the one time that I've done it perfect, there are some pieces of the cornstarch that have solidified. Tiny little balls, we wanna hold these behind. We want to make sure that everything is perfect, smooth, almost make it ice cream-like consistency. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, look at this, fantastic. Now we strain this to perfection. All that we need to do is plate it. I got a couple of little additions that you're going to find very, very unique. I put it away to cool off a little bit, it's starting to set, and this at this point is when we place it into the vessel of our choice. As you know, I'm a fan of martini glasses. First, I love martini. Second, I think it makes a wonderful presentation. Then we have one last addition, the pistachio nuts that I like to sprinkle right on top of it. They add a wonderful flavor because whatever you bite that you'll take, there's going to be a tiny bit 
of a pistachio nut that will follow with it. And just a tiny bit, not too much, don't exaggerate it, but a tiny bit of chocolate, because chocolate is the other addition that personifies the rendition of this wonderful gelo di melone. And this is how you make the perfect watermelon pudding, Palermo style. Little did my father know that the dream that was his, one day, became mine. So to honor him, every once in a while, I make this wonderful dishes, and I call him Vini. Vini is what my brother and I used to call my dad, little Vincenzo. So, Vini, I love you. And thank you for Mariuccia. It's a story I'll never forget.